So in this video we're going to prove that if you have two continuous functions and you compose them together, then that new function, that composite function, will also be continuous. So we're going to have two functions then, f and g, which are both going to be real valued functions and they're both going to be defined on some subset of the real line. And for simplicity I've made those subsets closed intervals, so the domain of the function f is this interval from a to b, and the domain of the function g is this interval from c to d. And we're going to assume that these two functions that we're starting with are both continuous over their entire domain, so f is continuous over this entire interval and g is continuous over this entire interval. What we're now going to consider doing is creating a third function by composing f with g, where this means Firstly do the function g and then do the function f, and this is going to be a function from the domain of the function g, so from the interval cd into the real line. Now in order for us to be able to compose f with g, it needs to be the case that the image of the function g in the real line is contained within the domain of the function f, i.e. if you take any element in this domain and ask what is it being mapped onto, in the real line by the function g, it has to be some real number that is inside this interval, i.e. the domain for f, so that we can then put it into the function f to find where it's overall mapped by this composite function. If that wasn't the case, if you had an element in this domain that is being mapped onto something that's outside of this interval, then you wouldn't actually be able to define the composite of f with g for that element because it will be mapped onto something and then the function f isn't defined necessarily for that thing that it's being mapped onto, so you can't then ask what is f mapping it then onto. So I've written that criterion that we need to be the case here. Uh, so capital G of this set, which is the entire domain, means the image of the function little g, and I've written that it's going to be contained within the domain of our function f, which is the interval a, b. So this composite function then is going to take any x inside this domain and it's going to map it onto this, where this means firstly ask what is g of x, so what does the function g map x onto, and then put that answer into the function f and we'll get a real number and that's going to be the answer of what x is mapped onto by the composite of f with g. So the claim now is that because the two initial functions, f and g, are both continuous on their entire domains, then we can conclude that this third function, the composite of f with g, is also going to be continuous over its entire domain. So let's prove this. So we need to show that for all p inside the domain, the interval from c to d, the limit as x approaches p of the function f of g of x is equal to the value of the function at that point p, i.e. f of g of p. So I've drawn a picture here that is going to help us understand this proof. So here we have the domain of our composite function f composed with g, so it's the interval cd, and here is our general point p inside that interval. Now, that point p is firstly going to be mapped by the function g to g of p here, and we know that g of p is going to be somewhere inside the interval a, b, because that's what we've already said, that anything inside this interval is mapped onto some real number that has to be inside the domain of the function f. That has to be the case, otherwise we can't even define what the composite of the function f with g means for the point p. So p is being mapped onto g of p, and that's going to be inside this interval a, b. Now, g of p is going to be mapped by the function f, then, onto the value f of g of p that is somewhere inside the real line. So this picture nicely represents the composite function of f composed with g. So in order then to show that the limit as x approaches p of f of g of x is equal to f of g of p, I need to apply the epsilon delta definition for the limit of a function. So I need to show that for all epsilon intervals around f of g of p here, and that's what is shown in blue here, this is an epsilon interval, so it's the interval f of g of p minus epsilon to f of g of p plus epsilon, that I can find a delta interval around p, and that's what's shown in yellow here, an interval p minus delta to p plus delta, such that all the points inside that interval are going to be mapped into this epsilon interval around f of g of p. If it's then true for all epsilon greater than zero that you can find a delta interval that is mapped entirely into that epsilon interval, 
then that successfully shows that the function gets and stays indefinitely close to this value f of g of p as x gets closer to p. Note that I don't need to bother excluding the centerpiece from my delta intervals. In order to prove this limit is equal to something, I don't need to prove that the centerpiece is mapped into these epsilon intervals, but I don't, in this case, need to exclude it because p is mapped onto f of g of p that is, of course, always going to be inside these epsilon intervals because it's the centerpiece. So whatever epsilon you take that is bigger than zero, f of g of p is always going to be inside there. Therefore, the centerpiece of these delta intervals is always guaranteed to be inside the epsilon intervals. So because of the value of this limit, I don't need to bother excluding the centerpiece from my epsilon delta definition here. So let's proceed with the proof. So this proof is actually really simple. I'm just going to use the fact that the functions f and g are continuous everywhere on their domain. So firstly, because the function f is continuous everywhere on its domain, g of p is a point inside its domain. So the function is going to be continuous at g of p. So I know that the limit as x approaches g of p of f of x is equal to f of g of p. This means that whatever epsilon interval you put around f of g of p, there will exist a delta interval, in fact we'll call it delta bar, around g of p, so that's what's shown in red here, it's the interval g of p minus delta bar to g of p plus delta bar, such that all the points inside that delta bar interval are going to be mapped into this epsilon interval. And note again, I don't need to bother excluding the centerpiece because we know g of p is going to be inside this interval because it's going to be mapped onto f of g of p that is the centerpiece of this interval. So next, we just apply continuity of g everywhere on its domain. So we know that g is going to be continuous at the point p, which is being mapped onto g of p. So we know that the limit as x approaches p of g of x is going to equal g of p. This means that whatever epsilon interval you put around g of p, and we're going to use delta bar as our epsilon, so this delta bar interval is our epsilon interval, I can find you a delta interval around p, here's my delta interval, p minus delta to p plus delta, such that it's mapped entirely into this delta bar interval around g of p. And again, I don't need to worry about excluding the centerpiece because obviously p is mapped onto g of p that is always going to be inside that interval. So now I can conclude that all the points inside this delta interval are going to be mapped into this epsilon interval because they are all mapped into this delta bar interval here and all the points inside that delta bar interval are then mapped into this epsilon interval. So hence, from any epsilon interval, you can find a delta interval that is mapped entirely into it. So that completes the proof, and we had a general point P, so this argument is going to hold true for all points P in the domain. So overall, we can conclude that if we have two functions that are continuous over their entire domains, and we can compose them together because this is true, then that composite function is going to be continuous over its entire domain.